we will continue with our next uh, speakers. And it is uh, Melanie Anderson, uh, who is Director, Cryptographic Security and System Development at the Canadian Centre of Cybersecurity. Welcome. And Jonathan Hamill, Senior Technical Advisor for the Cryptographic Security and Lead for the Cryptographic Standards at the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity. Welcome both. I'm looking forward to, to listen and to hear about your talk on how the Canadian government is preparing for post-quantum cryptography. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, b before we begin, I would like to start uh, by acknowledging that, the, that we're gathered today on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabek Nation, and that uh, since time immemorial, the Algonquin have cared for and continue to care for the land upon which in this, in this uh, Ottawa River watershed and uh, we're pri privileged to live and uh, visit this uh, area. So, thank you. Um, my name is Jonathan, and um, in my role at the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity, I advise our clients on cryptographic security, and um, the Government of Canada, of course, is uh, our major client, and um, I also participate in international standards bodies representing the Cyber Centre and the Government of Canada. So I'll pass it along to Melanie. Thank you, Jonathan. Good afternoon, everyone. It is an absolute privilege to be here today uh, to speak to you about the work that we're doing within the government. Um, as Paul mentioned, Melanie Anderson, Director of Cryptographic and Security and Systems Development at CSE as part of the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity. And so uh, my team and I are, are basically responsible for everything cryptographic security. When you think about anything cybersecurity that involves cryptography, that is us. Uh, we also provide advice and guidance on uh, protocols and algorithms, as well as upgrading national security systems uh, and working uh, with within the high assurance realm, uh, the world of ComSec, for any of you who might be familiar with that. So uh, there's a lot going on at all times, uh, but we're very excited to be here in, in, of course, our hometown of Ottawa. So I think to get started, I'm uh, just going to provide uh, and make sure that the slides are moving. Fingers crossed. Excellent. Uh, so I wanted to give you just a bit of background around just what is the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity for those of you who might not be familiar. And so we are a clear and trusted source of relevant cybersecurity information for Canadians. Uh, a few years ago when the Cyber Centre was stood up, we, our remit expanded beyond just the federal government, uh, which was our uh, initial information technology security mandate, to be for uh, critical infrastructure, uh, small, medium businesses, all Canadians. And so we have... Uh, you may have seen a massive public shift for us uh, to uh, the, the external world, which didn't really happen before. From an, I've been at CSE for 20 plus years and becoming very public facing was, it was, a, was a transition for us. But we are out there, we are doing as much as we can to educate and inform uh, the Canadian uh, government, public, and all of the systems that we rely on as Canadians. And so we provide targeted cybersecurity advice and guidance to protect the country's most important cyber systems. So we are out there working very heavily with our critical infrastructure partners to ensure that those systems are secure as they can be. We also work very closely with the private sector uh, to solve Canada's most complex cyber challenges. Uh, you'll hear this often from us, cyber defense is a team sport, we cannot do it all. We, are, we talked about the cybersecurity uh, talent gap earlier. There is not enough of us, and there are many problems that we have to solve together. So it's really important to us that we collaborate with all of you between industry, academia, and government, and our citizens. Uh, we also develop and share our specialized cyber defense technology and knowledge. Uh, we have a lot of in-house uh, information that we're able to use and tools and techniques uh, informed by our classified intelligence that we also have access to uh, that really helps us to, to deliver some of the, the most sophisticated uh, cyber defense tools in the world. Uh, we're very proud of that and we work very closely with our international allies as well to ensure that we are as secure as possible as we can be in, in Canada. And of course, uh, you, you all hear on the news on a regular basis um, various uh, attacks that happen. Um, we are the lead government operational response um, during cyber events. So it is busy all the time, uh, but it, uh, it's, it's something that we take very seriously and a mission that we are very committed to. Uh, but that's generally the cyber center. 
we are not necessarily directly involved in all of that, but I am very happy to take questions at the end if anybody has any. So what do we do? So this is kind of just a, a sampling of the, the different services that we offer. Um, specifically, when we talk about anything related to crypto, uh, the expert advice and guidance, we have many publications on our website that talk about use of cryptographic algorithms and protocols, uh, also how to prepare for the quantum threat. Uh, this is something that we, this is our bread and butter and what we do every day, so if you haven't seen those, um, you'll see our website in the, on the last slide, please check those out. Um, we also engage with critical infrastructure, as I said before. So we are actively working with many different groups. Um, there's actually a group, uh, the, the banking sector in Canada, that's working under the Canadian Forum for Digital Infrastructure Resiliency and the Quantum Readiness Working Group, which our team supports uh, in conjunction with our colleagues at ISED and Dr. McKelly Mosca. Uh, so we are actively involved with that group to help understand and inform what that transition is going to look like for the banking sector. Uh, obviously, government uh, and commercial cryptographic equipment assurance, again, that is our bread and butter and what we've been doing for many, many, many years at CSE. We are a partner with NIST. Uh, we work very heavily. Uh, it's, we have a joint partnership for the cryptographic module validation program, uh, as well as the cryptographic algorithm validation program and common criteria. Those are all something, those are all programs that we are heavily uh, involved in and also any sort of government, military, high assurance, um, secure communications, again, that, that falls to us. Uh, obviously, defending government networks and systems from cyber threats. Cryptography is a fundamental element of cybersecurity in what we do. So we do a lot of uh, education and, and advising on specific how to, how to use cryptography um, such that it is uh, a foundation for uh, cybersecurity as a whole. And lastly, information and technology sharing with the private sector. So again, we put out publications, we share as much information as we can in a timely manner. We know sometimes that you know government is uh, not able to share information as quickly as we would like. We are working on getting that, uh, we're working on making that better. Uh, but again, it's through forums like this that we really uh, appreciate being included in such that we can have those conversations and ensure that um, we can help all of you navigate this in a way that is effective um, for the entire community, not just Canada, but for the international community as well. Um, it's not on the slide, but what we don't do, <laughs> we are not a regulator. Um, so CSE is uh, the technical authority um, for the federal government for cybersecurity and cryptography. And so we advise and we guide based on the actual technology implementation impacts, but we do not regulate. We help to inform um, some of those specific things that are happening within government. I won't go into specifics, but there are a lot of things happening right now with respect to cybersecurity regulations, and that's something that we work in conjunction with our partners on. Uh, I would also be remiss to say we are one organization, and I think that's going to be in my next slide here. Uh, so. We are one organization in the entire government of Canada that is working on this. This is a responsibility moving forward is going to be the responsibility of all of the government of Canada departments um, to, to play in the role of the post-quantum uh, cryptography transition. So this presentation today represents our views from a Canadian Center for Cybersecurity perspective um, as that technical authority on cybersecurity and cryptography for the GC. But I will say, we also work very closely, I mentioned before, with ISED, with uh, Treasury Board Secretariat, with Shared Services Canada, with GAC, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of everywhere. <laughs> so um, we do not do this alone, it is a team sport, uh, and we really appreciate the collaboration that we have within the government. The other thing I'll say, we've, we've talked a lot about the U.S. government, uh, and I won't steal uh, Jonathan Sunder, he'll talk a little bit about that later, but we've talked about all the different organizations that are involved in setting those directives that have come out from the White House, so the National Security Agency, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, as well as um, CISA, and I'm the, the acronym, I, I'm blanking on that right now, but uh, basically you can think of the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity as kind of the role and mandate of those three organizations, that's us. Um, so when you look at the guidance sets uh, put out from NSA, we work very closely with NSA. Um, I'm down in Washington all the time uh, talking with them about basically where things are going, um, how to make sure that we are tightly aligned with those specific timelines as well. And so Jonathan will go into a, a bit more detail about the specific memos that come out, what that means for us in Canada. And we're very open to helping people understand what is that impact to Canada and what is the government of Canada's position on that? Because I know sometimes 
um, we're not able to put out publications quickly enough to, to be able to respond to what does this mean for Canada, um, but it doesn't mean we're not there. So we do have regular conversations with our partners at NSA, at NIST, uh, and at CISA with respect to those publications that do get put out. So again, we are always happy to answer any questions that folks might have about what does that mean for Canada and the impact. So I've talked enough. I'm going to hand it over to Jonathan to talk us through the next few slides. Um, so one of the first um, objectives that we have is ensuring the availability of quantum safe solutions. And so this started uh, many years ago when we started, our researchers started studying post-quantum cryptography. Uh, and, and now we have the NIST selections and, and it was building that confidence in those NIST selections that we could recommend to the government of Canada and all of our clients in, in, in Canada that, that we are confident that, that uh, you should use the, this post-quantum cryptography. We participate in standards activities related to adoption of post-quantum cryptography because of course once the NIST selections are, are, the standards are published, those need to go into protocols and need to be used properly and slides earlier, like if you looked at uh, the 5G uh, mind map that Matthew had, that th there's a lot of interaction between standards. Um, thirdly, we're also monitoring developments in quantum technologies and providing guidance on the quantum threat, and um, th this is kind of an ongoing thing, and, and we, we also use, the e we use a lot of external sources, um, but we're also involved in quantum research ourselves. Uh, just in January, the Government of Canada put out a national quantum strategy in which we um, have different missions and, and that was uh, led by ICED to, um, to further developments in quantum technologies a, as well as research in, in using quantum communications for cybersecurity and their potential future use. So, uh, Melanie mentioned about the U.S. directives, and, and so one of the important things I wanted to cover was perhaps how the landscape in Canada differs from uh, how it is being approached in the U.S. And so there's the White House has put out the National Security Memorandums. There was two issued last year related to the protection of U.S. government systems against quantum threat. Uh, the first one in January was directions for national security systems, which are those containing classified information. And I'm not going to talk much about that in this talk, um, but uh, there, there was mention about the CNSA 2.0, and though those um, recommendations apply to national security systems, which may not be the use case that everyone is looking at. Um, NSM 10. Uh, which was put out a little bit later, is more towards the um, non-classified systems, the, the externally facing systems, and, th and that transition is being led by NIST and CISA. And there's a number of timelines there related to the publication of the final standards from NIST, but it also directed that uh, U.S. financial a or federal agencies sh shall not procure commercial PQC solutions in advance of the NIST standards. And then uh, more recently in, in December, the, the um, uh, Congress passed the Quantum Computing Cybersecurity Preparedness Act, and that put more uh, specific timelines for various things, like that in June, that guidance will be given to federal agencies for migrating to PQC, involving both creating an inventory as well as prioritizing systems for the transition. In December, they're expecting that federal agencies will provide their inventory and prioritization to the OMB and CIS and the White House. Um, there's still timelines uh, tied to the publication of NIST standards, like one year after NIST standards, agencies should have a plan on how to migrate IT systems in line with the prioritization. And then there's requirements for the OMB to report back on, on how that uh, migration is going and what the cost and financial estimates of that will be. Um, uh, just a couple days ago, um, the U.S. President signed the National Cybersecurity Strategy, and in there you'll see that there's a strategic objective tied to post-quantum cryptography, and, and that these are all very positive steps because the U.S. is, is a much bigger market than Canada is, and, and they're able to drive uh, the transition in, in commercial products that, that we can't uh, within uh, the Canadian small, much smaller Canadian market. Um, 
the government of Canada also produces publications. Melanie mentioned our awareness pieces and, and um, things that we provide. Uh, we also have a national uh, cyber threat assessment that is put out by the Cyber Centre and in there is also um, advice or guidance on that uh, producing awareness for the post-quantum transition. But um, in regards to um, highly sensitive systems, these national security systems, we're integrated with our allies and so we're kind of aligned with those migration timelines that are issued by the U.S. because of our clo close cooperation and equipment supply chain. But for the less sensitive IT systems that are, are externally facing, we're kind of a little unique amongst, amongst our allies in that we have this um, centrally managed uh, IT system with by Shared Services Canada that, that uh, provides across the Government of Canada. And so we have internal IT management committees that bring together experts in cybersecurity, uh, policy makers, and IT administrators to discuss how to and improve the Government of Canada's digital re resilience and cybersecurity. And we leverage those IT management committees in order to transition the PKI that we use within the Government of Canada from SHA-1 to SHA-2. And so we're le we're going to use lessons learned based on that to to manage the transition to uh, post quantum cryptography. Um, Melanie mentioned about critical infrastructure. We we have partnerships with with organizations in critical infrastructure, in including through various forums, and uh, we perhaps have fewer operators than uh, in the U.S. And so that perhaps is an advantage that we have uh, enables the close cooperation. Um, the Cyber Center is always uh, engaged with those and we and uh, we have made a number of presentations on on the quantum threat to those groups. Um, and we can leverage cybersecurity actions under our national strategy for critical infrastructure and our national cybersecurity strategy which is currently undergoing a revision. So our plan for protecting GC IT systems for the post-quantum threat is first uh, is, is what we recommend to any organization is to identify and inventory cryptographic systems. And in the Government of Canada, this effort is ongoing right now. Um, th that, that can be done in automated methods, but also we have, uh, we have knowledge of various systems that, that we know need to be transitioned. GC um, procurement language that is uh, used by government departments to purchase products that contain cryptographic modules. That procurement language that uh, is issued for um, contractors has been updated to ensure that vendors are aware of the need to provide quantum safe cryptography once we advise from the cyber center that, it, that they should do so. And we'll update our cryptographic guidance. Um, we have uh, publications that recommend cryptographic algorithms, but we'll update those when the standards are available and vendors can offer certified products with that are validated for post-quantum cryptography. S some of our concerns about um, that w why we advise government of uh, departments not to transition right now uh, to post-quantum cryptography is the risks in early adoption. And th this is some of the things that we list here that uh, there's parameter selection and final tweaks to the algorithms are still being considered. Today's implementations were before the standardization of vetted uh, specifications and may even be based on earlier versions of the algorithm and you need to manage that on whether this is a round two implementation or a round three implementation. The implementations cannot yet be certified as, as correct and secure under the cryptographic module validation program. Uh, it's known as FIPS validation. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the standards for protocols have to be updated. And, and we don't like to see the custom modifications to, to, stand to protocol standards because we have a protocol validation team which, uh, which analyzes uh, the protocols for flaws and particularly leveraging formal verification. And it could uh, result in, in interoperability challenges with future deployments, resulting in increased costs and further changes down the road. Um, there's been a lot of mention about use of hybrid post-quantum cryptography along with uh, classical and 
Um, there, there are some use cases that we've thought about uh, where hybrid post-quantum cryptography could be used, and, and we also try and think, oh, well, what are the risks or what are the considerations about deploying it in such scenarios? And so one of the use cases is for risk mitigation. And so if, it, uh, as mentioned earlier, if the post-quantum algorithm has a flaw, like if it, because they haven't perhaps been studied as long, people may uh, be concerned about the security of those algorithms, then, then unfortunately your hybrid system does not have post-quantum security. This can be giving a false sense of security. And so um, you need to analyze whether this, th what, what you're really basing your risk analysis on. If you're combining two post-quantum algorithms, this could require a future transition in desire to improve efficiency in the future, once you're more confident in them, if you wish to remove that complexity. Um, it also introduces uh, complexity, particularly with authentication, um, like tracing certificate chains back. There's been lots of discussion about that in, in either mixed chains or, or various hybrid or composites. Um, one thing that we recommend for our more hi higher security um, solutions is using a layered solution, and th and that provides broader protection against implementation flaws. So that's like kind of um, an encapsulation that you do uh, cryptography on one layer, and then that's totally encapsulated by another layer, and that it provides a uh, better protection than perhaps just a hybrid in in one particular cryptographic algorithm. Um, one other use case is the ease of transition, um, and that may not be needed for negotiated protocols. It depends. Um, you need to consider downgrade protection and uh, perhaps a future transition to remove the classical fallback, such that you don't like having dead code around that, is, uh, that may not be used in the future. And one of the challenges of this is that it, it may be possible to do along with risk mitigation, and it may be not. It depends on your solution. Uh, policy compliance is an interesting one because jurisdictions may have specific cryptographic policies that do not share the same post-quantum uh, algorithms, and so a hybrid may allow communications to satisfy both policies at once. Um, and then protocol integration, some protocols may kind of require the use of uh, a hybrid solution, such as if you're doing a, d a protection for denial service for uh, Ike v2, that you'd want to use a s much smaller um, classical scheme at the beginning. And so standards organizations are c still considering how hybrid could be used. System owners, we recommend, need to make a policy decision on when to use hybrid, and the government of Canada has not yet made a decision on when, when where hybrid should be used. We're not rec saying don't use hybrid. We're just saying that uh, we need to make those on a use case basis. Excellent, thank you, Jonathan. So in terms of current recommendations that we have um, within the government of Canada, and of course, take any of these as, 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 you, as you will, um, the first thing is really evaluate the sensitivity of your organization's information and determine its lifespan to develop a quantum risk assessment. Um, on, as organization and, and data owners, you are the ones that have to make that decision. Um, you need to understand the lifespan of that data, how sensitive is it. Um, if we're talking about um, specific um, threats right now, you know, our, 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 our guidance is that as early as the 2030s is w when we believe, and that's based on a lot of the references that were, were shared uh, today, um, specifically, um, I forget which presentation it was in, but there was the, the, the specific timeline. Um, this is really important to, to take seriously now. We don't have to panic. We have time to plan and to get this right. Um, but it's important that as data owners and as system owners, you take the time to understand where those cryptographic elements are um, when we talk about inventory, but also assessing the, the risk of that data and the, the longevity of it. Um, the second recommendation is, again, determining the IT supplier for products or services, protecting that information at risk. So understand where um, those mechanisms are from a business standpoint. Uh, and then look at developing a transition plan for enterprise managed IT systems to become quantum safe and adopting cryptographic agile products and practices where possible. I know we've, we talked about that earlier today, the concept of cryptographic agility. That's actually something that we have a publication on on our, on our website on cyber.gc.ca. Um, so again, understanding that and being prepared such that when things come, we are prepared to be able to make that switch as quickly as we can is really, really important. 
Uh, and, and from a government perspective, again, we're, ga we're engaging with SSC and cloud service providers now on the roadmaps for the externally managed IT systems to become quantum safe. So just socializing the idea and making sure that as, as your organizations are working with vendors, or if you are a vendor, what is your plan? What is, and, and making sure that you're sharing that with clients and customers is going to raise the visibility um, of the importance of this transition uh, to folks moving forward. And last, ensuring the use of, again, GC procurement requirements for cryptographic products um, is, is something that's, that we are heavily involved in. Uh, and, and certainly, you can ask uh, Cyber Center for technical advice and guidance at, at any time. Um, the last thing, and this is something that we say a lot to folks, is um, we do, we do not, uh, please do not adopt PQC in production systems until it's recommended, until those standards are in place and we've updated our guidance. That's really important. Um, there are risks, again, as Jonathan mentioned, if you, if you transition too early, certainly play around with everything that's out there right now um, in a non-production um, capacity to understand it, to, to better plan within your organizations, but we do not recommend um, adopting that in production yet. Um, the last thing I'll say uh, as we close, before we open it up for questions, whoop, actually that's a timeline. Um, this information that we're providing right now is a snapshot in time. As you all know, uh, things are changing rapidly in this environment, in this ecosystem that we all work in. Uh, so certainly as uh, things change, the government position is going to continue to, to change over time. So I just wanted to, to make that very clear that this is as of today, <laughs> this is our recommendations and where we're going based on what we know. Uh, last slide, expect a timeline for the transition. Uh, for those of you who maybe uh, were at the International Cryptographic Module Conference in, um, in Washington, uh, or near Washington, D.C. in September, Troy Lang from NSA, uh, who's actually um, my boss's counterpart at NSA, who we speak with regularly, he was a keynote address. Uh, and one of his lines was, now is not the time to panic, it's the time to plan. And we wholeheartedly agree with that statement. Uh, again, we have time. It's important that we work together as a community. We can't do this in isolation. Uh, and so, as uh, has been mentioned before, the PQ, uh, PQC standards are expected to be out in 2024, protocol and vendor support in 2025, and then certification programs will be updated as well in 2026 and 2027, and planning to start that transition at that point, noting that the government is very aware of um, the capacity for some of those certification programs, um, such that I, I fully expect, and this is Melanie Anderson's point of view, but I fully expect there will be more resources dedicated um, to ensuring that those certification programs are updated and um, certifications are issued in a, a more timely manner as things get closer because we do recognize the urgency of this and the, the importance of it from a cybersecurity standpoint. So with that, uh, thank you very much for having us. Um, please, again, check out our website. We have lots of publications about cryptography and uh, preparing for the quantum threat to cryptography. And we'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. That, that were some great takeaways. Very clear, very interesting. Um, great pop. Uh, don't panic. Plan. Great. Um, are there any questions from the remote audience? No? Anyone from the room that would have a question for Melanie or Jonathan this time? No? Well, then we will see you in a few minutes back on stage for the panel. And uh, thank you for your presentation.